Kind of give me an overview of what the weekend's going to look like. Um, <clears throat> so first, shout outs. Just like Stephen Stefan said, Ironside, my dudes. Uh, this is a gym I work out. If you guys are ever in Boston, you got to come by. Number one gym in America. Completely sick mm -hmm. facility. Mike Blow Strength Conditioning. USA Ultimate has been an absolutely huge supporter uh, and has been huge for kind of getting the word out. And then everybody has helped to make Moral Performance a, a, a global brand. But the biggest playmakers here are Steph, Stefan and Slump. So let's give them a real deal. Round of applause. For it, takes, it, it takes a lot of vision to, uh, to think about making this play earlier, a long, long time ago and everything coming together. And we're finally here. So this is, this is cool. Um, so let me ask you guys this. Why, why do we play ultimate? Somebody shout out, why is the real reason that we all play ultimate? It's fun. It's fun. I heard it. I heard it. It's fun. It's fun. Really? I, that's, I mean, bro ship is huge. The glory is huge. Challenging yourself. But what it really comes down to is we want to have fun, right? So when we think about training for ultimate, we train so we have more fun. And the way that I think about it is we've got two kind of sides of the spectrum, two different modes of training. We need to go out and we need to practice throwing, catching, our offense, our defense, our hucks. Um, and we know when we go out to the field for, say, a month and we just practice those buttery forehands, practice, 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 then we go to a tournament and we just butter one and it 
floats right in. You're like, yes, all that hard work paid off. That was fun. Okay, so there's a, there's a time and place, absolutely essential to get good at the skills of ultimate. But this is what I offer, the performance training. <laughs> Performance training will run faster, will jump higher, will cut better, nobody will be able to guard you, you'll get more Ds, and when we do all these things, we have more fun. We, when we sky somebody, whoo, that was fun. <laughs> so this is huge, but the biggest thing is performance training keeps you on the field. When you're injured on the sideline, it's hard to have as much fun as you could if you're in the game playing. So, Injury reduction and increased performance are kind of what, what we're looking to, uh, to, to do here. So I think it's important to realize that there's a lot of different training methodologies. And we are not these things. But we need to take little bits from these things. So we need to appreciate what these things are. So bodybuilding. I was just in Austria where Arnold uh, is from Arnold's kind of the king of bodybuilding. What, tell me what bodybuilders train for. Look good. To look good. Yeah, to, to have mu big muscle symmetry. It's not about function at all. This is me when I used to train for bodybuilding. I may have looked okay, but I was not performing well because I was in the gym doing stupid stuff like cable crossovers, trying to get thigh separation. I was training for aesthetics, and that's not what's going to make you a better ultimate player. So we take little bits of bodybuilding, but, uh, but more so <coughs> Olympic lifting and powerlifting, we want to take other little bits from. So Olympic weightlifting, what, uh, somebody tell, does anybody know the two events that Olympic weightlifters train for? There's two movements. Clean and snatch. Yes, so the clean and jerk and the snatch. These guys spend their whole lives trying to pick up weight from the ground, catch it, dip, drive, put it over their head, that's the clean and jerk. The other one is the snatch, take it from the ground, boom, overhead. So Olympic weightlifter's life is to quickly move weight from the ground over their head. We can learn a lot from Olympic weightlifting. And we take, we, we do a lot, we're going to do some Olympic weightlifting here. Um, but we're not Olympic weightlifters, so we don't need to train all Olympic weightlifting style, which is a mistake a lot of us make. Um, Powerlifting. What are those three events of powerlifting? Does anybody know the three? Bench, squat, deadlift. Bench, squat, and deadlift. For one rep, these guys are trying to press as much weight as they can, bench press. And then they get a bunch of heavy weight on the floor and they pick it up as, as, uh, as heavy as they can. And then they put weight on their back and they squat down as heavy as they can. Great sport for getting strong. Yes, we need to get strong, but we are not powerlifters. Now, CrossFit is kind of a, a crazy thing going on in the world, um, and I think a lot of ultimate players are training for CrossFit, but what do CrossFitters train for? Repetitions. Repetitions to, they, they're training for CrossFit, like CrossFit is a sport in itself, and there's no rhyme or reason to it. There is, you know, a random, what they call workout of the day, and they come in and they, they just do this workout. There's no periodization, there's no building up to uh, a real peak, and it's mostly bilateral lifts, and that is not for ultimate players. So those are the things that we're not. This is what we are. We are single leg athletes. If you look at any time this Jimbo is sprinting, it, that foot is a, only one foot is in contact with the ground every time that we sprint. Look at. Uh, that's Willie jumping at a weight cap team. These guys are both jumping off one leg. Generally, we jump off one leg, and when we sprint, we're on one leg. Therefore, most of our training needs to be single leg. Most of it, not all of it. That is huge. We're also very, very asymmetrical. So when we look at, uh, generally, when we go to throw a forehand, we step out into this externally rotated hip position so that we can expose our torso to the field and we can get that kind of whip action. So if we only throw on that same side, we're always driving external rotation on the same side hip. We never do it on this side. That makes our hips wacky. We get, we get a lot of external rotation, but we're missing this internal rotation, most of us on our right side. Um, when we throw backhands, we get a ton of thoracic spine rotation 
but when we throw forehands, we barely rotate. So we, we're missing rotation this way. So our spines, a lot of us are very, what we call scoliosis. Um, shoulders, you can see Brody, most of us when we throw a forehand, we lead with the elbow, and that's going to give us a lot of external rotation, but we're missing internal rotation. Mm -hmm. So these are just some kind of common asymmetries that we see in Ultimate. And that's the reason why if we just did CrossFit, barbell movements, two arms, squatting on two legs, we would essentially be adding strength on top of this function. So that's why we call this the functional training model because we're trying to train ourselves into function so that we can reduce the risk of injuries. Because if we add too much strength or conditioning on top of dysfunction, that's where we hurt ourselves. Okay, so it's very important to understand these asymmetries and then understand how to train to kind of balance them out. And that's kind of the, the theory behind this whole training model. So functional ultimate training is about correcting these asymmetries, especially hip internal rotation. We're all, we've got so much of this, we're all missing this. Um, prioritize single leg training. Do not add strength on top of this function. We need to groove patterns and then add strength, power, and conditioning on top of them. So you'll notice when we're in the, the, uh, the open space, we'll do a lot of uh, kind of grooving patterns, and then I'll ask you guys when we go into the weight room, that's when we'll add strength and power on top of those patterns. Um, and this is big. We need, to, we need to understand the zen and jam states. And at, when we learn something, there's a couple different ways we can apply this. When we learn something, we need to be very mindful. We need to be in that zen state thinking, okay, how can I do this most efficiently? And then once it's like, okay, I've got a good pattern established, that's when you can jam on it. Now, this is a problem with a lot of ultimate players because we're all just like, woo, ultimate, we just want to run and, and just jam all the time. We, we live to jam. But if we always just go as hard as we can, we'll, we'll, it, it's not sustainable. Okay, so a lot of things that I'll say this week, and I'll be like, okay guys, I want you to do this drill, but I want you to be in zen mode right now. We're going 60% mellow, and then when I say, okay, you guys look good, now we can jam on it. And then you guys will be like, okay, let's flip the switch, and you guys can go all out. So that's one way of thinking zen and jam. Another way of thinking about it is developing ourselves as athletes is essentially a journey of self-mastery. We need to be able to flow between times of high tension and times of low tension. So th this graph kind of helps to, to show that, you know, when we're meditating or when we're doing yoga or when we're getting a massage, every, everything's turned off. We're trying to relax and be very, very low tension. And that's essential for, for us as athletes. But then there's a time that when we, get, when we need to uh, you know, accelerate and make that D, or we need to uh, jump for a sky, or we need to pick up a heavy deadlift, we need to be able to split the switch and get a, a two level high tension and really uh, make that play. So we need to practice and we need to be mindful of flowing between this continuum and knowing uh, how to have low tension and how to have high tension. So just some, some examples. You know, when I'm meditating, when we're getting a massage, that's very, very low tension. That's, a, that's our zen mode. You've got to be able to turn it all off. And a lot of times, I don't know if you guys get, where's your hand if you get routine massages? Any of us? Yes, me. <laughs> For longevity, it's, it's going to be huge. We'll talk about self myofascial fast release a lot this weekend. But I, I, like, I drink a lot of coffee, and it's, it's an issue because a lot of times when I go to get a massage, I just, I can't turn it off. I'm just like, everything's on. And I, that's why I really, me, I'm somebody who spent my whole early career here, and now I'm trying to spend more time here so I can have a, a longer career. So meditation, massage, and then there's the other end of the spectrum, getting a D, picking up a heavy deadlift. And some of you guys will pick on me, but I really like freestyle because it teaches you to be flowing and receiving of, of a light piece of, piece of frisbee. So I really encourage um, 
I really encourage freestyle. In Ultimate, you'll see it, there's a lot of times that, you know, you get the disc, you're running really faster in jam mode to get the disc, and then you've got to kind of be calm and almost like dance with the disc to make that throw. And then you see the guys that just aren't there, and they get the disc, and it's like, ah! And they're, they're so tight, and, and that's an issue. So it's up to us to know kind of where we are in this continuum and think, okay, I maybe need to spend a little more time over there or over there. Because there's also people who just can't flip the switch. They're just like 50% all the time, and you can't count on them to make a play because they just don't have that fifth gear. We need to develop that fifth gear. So essentially, there are three training environments. We need we train out of the field, or I guess you know the field, the uh, the gym, the uh, what it's called here. You guys are training train gymnasium, uh, but the field generally, and then there's the weight room, and then there's our zen room. So let's go into what we do in these places. So let's just call it the, the field, even though I know it gets cold in Munich. So the field is where we have our practices. It's where we practice offense, defense, and our skills work. But it's also where we do our speed and agility workouts. And the cool thing about all these kettlebells is before kettlebells, when we were out in the field, we could only practice speed, agility, conditioning, skills, and drills. We could not train the qualities of strength and power. But now we can take a kettlebell with us, and while we're out in the field, we can get strength and power work done outside. And that's huge. Do we, do we have, wire, do we have uh, internet on this? Um, no. Yeah, I have Google MTS. So. It's, it's, it's yeah. okay. Um, so this, this is where we're going to learn a lot of stuff in the curriculum of how to train when we're out at the <laughs> field, and kettlebells will come into play with that. Um, second place is the weight room. Weight room is the only place that we can do Olympic lifts, and Olympic lifts are so huge for uh, explosive power development. When you take a clean, we'll learn a hang power clean. A hang power clean is essentially jumping with weight, getting into this position, and then catching it. So if I can take 135 pounds and jump and catch, then when I go to do what we call a triple extension, extension of the hips, knees, and ankles in a game, which is what sprinting is and it's what jumping is, if I can do that with 135 pounds, then when I'm in the game, my hips are going to get through much faster. I'm going to be way more explosive. So Olympic lifts are so huge for developing explosive power. Um, and the weight room is the only place we can do that. And then we need to, really comes down to this. People are like, dude, I want to run faster. I want to jump higher. How do I do it? Like, you need to put more force into the ground. How do you, put, how do you develop the capacity to put more force into the, into the ground? You get strong. Okay, so the weight room is where all the weights are, and it, that's where we can put weight uh, and move load and develop strength, put more force on the ground, run faster, jump higher. So we need to be in the weight room. It's absolutely essential. And this is like Ultimate a couple years ago. We weren't there. Now it's like, okay, if you're not in the weight room and you're playing Ultimate, you're going to get left behind. Um, so we're going to get big into our weight room curriculum. Third thing is our Zen room. And this is just a kind of our recovery space, our, our place that we, uh, we try to turn the ship around. Because when we train, we are causing uh, not bad things, we're causing degradation to our body. So if we could take, uh, the, the quicker we can recover and turn around, the more that we can train. The more we can train, the more capacity that we have. So this is just an example. This is Capino's Ironside player hanging out with me in, in the Zen room. You can see there's all the books. There's, uh, there's uh, anybody know what these are called? Foam We've got foam rollers. We've got a rumble roller, a, uh, a regular foam roller. We've got our Airx pad, all of our mini bands, another soft tissue device. This is a softball used for soft tissue work on the psoas, a PVC pipe, which is a harder form of foam roller, uh, lacrosse balls. Uh, another small foam roller. We've got all these different tools to work on our bodies and try to turn the ship around. Um, so we'll see. Uh, Two Bob Crew is one of my favorite bands just for kind of like trippy, spaced out music that is really good for, uh, for spending time in the Zen room because you've got to go very internal 
when you're in the Zen room and think about, okay, where is my body tight? What do I need to do to get back to kind of my, my center? Um, so I encourage everybody to have a, uh, a Zen room. Um, so the goals for this weekend is for you guys to understand why we're doing the things that we're doing. There's a lot of athletes that just want, you know, hey, tell me what to do and I'm going to do it. You know, that doesn't really work in Ultimate because we don't have all that much coaching. I think the best athletes are the most aware athletes. The ones who understand, hey, I know why I'm going out and doing this many 10 cut agilities at the field. I know why I'm going to go to the weight room and do five hang cleans and then five of this exercise, this exercise. I know why I'm doing skater squats. You know, I know why I'm mobilizing internal rotation. I, I know why I'm doing my lateral skip series. You guys, you've got to understand why we do everything that we do. So I'm going to be very uh, kind of a, uh, a teach you how to fish rather than just give you the fish uh, approach. So if there's ever any questions all weekend, just Timmy or Timbro, whatever you want to call me, uh, <laughs> then then just just let me know. So well, you guys understand techniques behind weight room, techniques uh, and practices behind speed and agility development, kettlebell training, uh, warm up and recovery practices, and then big, big point is understand that everything is a progression. So, you know, you guys have what? Uh, does anybody know the exact amount of weeks before Europeans? Anybody like write that down yet? It's probably like 55 weeks or something. And you guys have essentially what, two years? Two far? Yeah. For well, this group, yeah, it's 2015, but for the most time, it's the first. Okay, so Lecco is first. Yeah. And then, with the national team, the next tournament will be August 2015. Okay, so we need to understand that everything is a progression. A lot of what we're going to get into today, or this weekend, is okay, here's where we start, but once you develop mastery, we're going to go further. So. Sets and reps are progression, exercise and progression, um, you know, it, phase by phase. The programming changes every three weeks to allow your body to adapt so you don't hit a plateau. So everything's a progression. And then I just love tweeting, so if you guys, you probably shouldn't be tweeting during the thing, but if you guys uh, ever want to tweet at me after the sessions, it'd probably make you really happy. Uh, okay. So. The thesis of this is we groove patterns and then we add strength and conditioning on top of those patterns. That, that's huge. And this is just a, a basic example. This is Logan doing triple extension. And we can see a straight line from his head, through his hips, through his knee, through his ankle. He is putting force directly that way. And he's got a good body angle, good arm action. That's a good acceleration starting position. And then here's George, we can see that same position, but he's throwing a med ball. So it's, it's kind of, we're, we're loading that position. Um, so let's get into this, weight room categories. Every time we lift, every single time we lift, we're gonna hit all these categories. Explosive hip extension, hip dominant strength, knee dominant strength, pushing, pulling, and core. Gone are the days where we train like bodybuilders where it's like, yo, I'm going to do upper body day today. Like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing a back day. That's, that's, not how, that's not how we train. We train every one of these. There's no more leg days. Okay, so this first category, explosive hip extension. <clears throat> Main movements that we're going to learn. The clean, we do the hang power clean. Hang means that we start here. Power means that we catch here. So the real clean with Olympic weightlifting is when they go all the way from the floor and come up and they catch in a full squat. We're not Olympic weightlifters. That's a little too technical. If you want to learn that, that's fine. But I think all we need, is, all we're after is this, this, this triple extension. So we use the hang power clean. Um, dumbbell snatch. And then we're going to get big into kettlebell swing variations. And kettlebells are just so sweet. Um, especially because we can condition loaded hip extension. So we're in jeans, but it's okay. This motion here, I'm getting my hips through. Okay, I'm squeezing my butt and I'm getting my hips through. 
Now, this motion of hip extension is what jumping is and it's what sprinting is. So what kettlebells allow us to do is do repeat bouts. I'm talking like even up to five minutes of swings or something like a, a kettlebell clean or a kettlebell snatch. And I have to be very violent with my hips. If I can do, say, 100 kettlebell snatches, then that's going to be a big transfer to, say, a long point ultimate, when an ultimate, I'm extending my hip, extending my hip, extending my hip, time and time again. But if I can load it with a kettlebell, then when I go to do it in the game, I'm going to condition that pattern. And that is huge. We've gotten to the point that we're doing 100 rep kettlebell snatch challenges. We're taking really heavy bells and we're swinging them for five minutes at a time. And then when you're out there playing and this pattern would get tired, it doesn't get tired because it's, it's now strong, it's explosive, and it's conditioned thanks to these little inventions. So, love, love kettlebells. And that's the cricket, by the way. If you guys don't know the cricket, you should know the cricket. Josh, many played in Germany actually. All oh, Hans played with you, yes. and he changed the landscape and Aachen Ultimate at least. When was he in Germany? You didn't tell me he was in Germany. Yeah, I think three years ago. He lived there for. He didn't want to leave my apartment. He, yeah. he lived there for three months. <laughs> <laughs> Cricket's one of the best throwers in the world. So when I hang out with them, we don't do trick shots. We do. Trick shots. <laughs> so if you guys, Bad Kid TV, want to go out and do trick shots sometime for an episode, do not call them trick shots. Call them crick shots. Okay? <laughs> trick shots are for Brody. Crick shots are for us. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> I love that way. <laughs> that's, that's my girl Roberta. She's a uh, volleyball player. She's one of the best volleyball players in the world. But I put that picture up because it's an SLDL. She's got a great single leg deadlift. She's got straight position all the way through. She's moving the load with that left side glute and hamstring. Great, great movement. Hip dominant. And then there's Jimbo doing a single leg shoulder elevated hip bridge. Hip dominant means that I'm moving the load mostly with my hip. My my knee is not moving very much. My knee is kind of in this position, or in Jimbo's case, it's just staying in that 90 position. So hip dominant means I'm moving the mo load mostly back here, and these are the movements that we'll learn. Knee dominant means that I'm going through a lot of knee motion. So this, is, this would be a knee, uh, a split squat, a knee dominant movement. So knee dominant strength, huge for developing cutting ability, huge for developing uh, they're decreasing your risk of ACLs or any kind of knee injury. Have you guys, anybody have an ACL or tear their ACL here? Oh, no, was, it, a couple of us. Yeah, it's, it's an issue. It's, it's a big issue. It tends to happen with females, but there's just some basic things that we can do in training that will absolutely decrease that risk. Um, so a split squat, generally, in this position, it's going to be 60% the front leg moving the load, about 40% the back leg. Um, when I elevate my rear foot, like Kibo here, it's going to be about 80%, 20%. So I'm really not using that back leg much. I'm trying to load this area here. Um, and then skater squat or one leg squat like Haley is 100% stability on that front leg. And that's huge. So we need to be able to do all three of these uh, well. Front squat is also a great movement. It transfers well to the clean. And I'm not against bilateral lifts. I just think that we need to establish symmetry first. And then if you could show me that you're symmetrical and you're not going to squat like this, like a lot of us do, then we can load a, uh, a front squat. Next is pushing. We can push horizontally or we can push vertically. So we use push-ups. We use one-arm DD press, which is what George is doing. Uh, and then we go to one arm, or alternating press, and then we go to two arm press. Um, and we can also do, this is a half kneeling overhead press, which gets us into a good position. <laughs> pulling, we can do a horizontal and vertical pulling as well. So our horizontal pulling would be something like a DB row. 
or a single leg uh, cable row, and then vertical pulling is chin-ups. We start with chin-ups, we progress to pull-ups. Pull-ups are much harder, and it's a mistake a lot of us make is we start here, and then we end up doing pull-ups like this with a bunch of trap elevation, and that's, uh, that, that's a problem. Um, <clears throat> and then core exercises. We do uh, chops and lifts if you have cables. We do the dead bug series. We do straight leg sit-ups, which can progress to a Turkish get-up. Um, planks, we, planks are awesome exercises, but we do them for breaths. <sighs> Not just for time. Anybody can do a plank for five minutes if you're just hanging out like this. We do them to work on our diaphragm. And then we progress planks. And the body saws, which is what George is doing, he's here, and these these bow sides are going back and forward. Luckily, we have frisbees, and we can do those with frisbees. Okay, so those are our basic categories in the weight room. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna get break those down. Yes. Chops and lifts are when you need to take a cable, and say the cable machine was here, and it's one of those uh, apparatuses where you see the bodybuilders doing the these silly exercises with. <laughs> and you would go one, two, like this. This would be a lift, and I'm getting a lot of stability here, and the chop would be taking it from here, boom, 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 boom. Excellent exercises for developing symmetry because we do on both sides, but a lot of us aren't going to train in a weight room where we have cables. So it really depends if you have cables or not. Like a, a, lot, of, a lot of us are not going to be training a lot of us are going to be training at different places, right? Like we're not all going to get 50 of us together every Tuesday morning and train at the same gym. So, uh, so what you do kind of depends on what your facilities have. Some facilities don't even have barbells that spin. You know, I, I've had, I've gone to facilities that like the barbells, nobody does Olympic lifts. They only use them for bench press and deadlift. So they don't actually, the, the neuron doesn't actually spin. And that's a problem when you go to do an Olympic lift. If that thing locks up on you, you can hurt your wrist. So a lot of this depends on facilities, and that's why some of us may not have access to a good facility, and that's another reason we're gonna do a lot of kettlebell work. And pal off press is the same thing where I have a cable coming here and I go in and out and it's trying to take me that way. It's anti-rotation. I'm trying to resist rotation. <laughs> okay, so speed. We're going to talk about linear acceleration and maybe a little bit of top end speed. We don't have a whole lot of time. I'm hoping uh, we'll see you guys again in the future. We can kind of pick up where we left off, but acceleration is much more important than top end speed in, uh, in Ultimate. So we'll talk about how to load the glutes, how to get into your glute to get it on stretch, which is very similar. You'll see this is my starting position. I hope you guys get back on your heel so that glute gets on stretch. Very similar to how we would load a cable SLDL, getting that glute on stretch and moving the weight uh, with your glutes. So we'll see a lot of this kind of glute loading idea this weekend. Um, all about the glutes. Agility, this is huge. Um, IFP versus OFP agility is a big concept we need to understand. And essentially it's this, if I'm in an athletic position, and I want to go that way, I can either use IFP or OFP, meaning inside foot push or outside foot push. So if I'm here, IFP, I would push the ground with the inside of my right foot. So it's just a push. Inside foot push. And we see IFP in jab steps, defensive shuffles, marking, we're pushing off the inside of our foot. And then OFP would be if I pushed off the outside, the pinky toe side, I would push under and I would have kind of a, um, kind of a crossover position. We use crossovers with 180 degree turns. We use jab steps with shorter turns. So we need to practice both of them. And you can see that's a clip from my new, uh, my new product, the, the Future, and you can just see that it's, I'm pushing the ground uh, away, it's hip abduction. And then this is uh, CFO pushing underneath, that's adduction, OFP, IFP. Does that make sense? Yes? Could you uh, explain the words adduction and abduction for all? Yeah, so abduction would just mean that I'm pushing the hip away from the midline. So when I do a jab or a 
uh, a shuffle, I'm pushing the ground that way. When I do a jab step, I push the ground that way. So I'm kind of sliding the carpet out. Adduction, A-D-D, add, means I'm adding to the midline. So I'm pushing the ground that way. This is adduction. This is abduction. So add, ab. Kind of a technical term, but all you need to remember is IFP versus OFP. And we'll get big time into this. So <laughs> once we groove these IFP, OFP patterns and we get really good at extending the hip this way and this way, then we groove, we groove it, then we condition it. So the, the most fundamental way to groove IFP is a serpentine. Raise your hand if you've run a serpentine agility drill before. Okay, good. Thank God. Okay. And then conditioning for OFP, we use 5 10 fives. Uh, We use the, the death drill or the 10 pin agility drill, which I think we'll probably get to this weekend, which is just crazy. It's short, short, long, long, middle, short, short, long, long, middle. It's one rep. And that's all. Uh, OFP, buttery, crossovers. And then this is another drill that we use, the, uh, the five cut box. Okay, um, and then the last couple things that we need to get to is, is self myo fast release, four-way hip side stretching, and gluteivation. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> that word gluteivation? That's Russell Wallach made that word up. I can't take credit for it. But it's kind of, it was kind of trending on Twitter earlier this last week. Uh, so <laughs> SMR, does anybody know what the word uh, SMR means? So self and then myofascial release. What does the prefix myo mean? Muscle something. Muscle, yeah. So self, muscle, and fascia release. So I don't, let me see if I have, she's this. So we're athletes, we play sports, our, things on our body are gonna get tight. It's just inevitable. And because we're so asymmetrical, we're gonna have different, uh, kind of what we call trigger points on different sides of the body. So if this is a nice clean piece of tissue, then it would be very easy just to stretch it and lengthen the whole thing, which is what we wanna do in most cases. But when we get trigger points or tight spots, we get these little knots in the muscle. So we use myofascial release to essentially rub out those bumps and get it to release. So if we were just to say, oh, I'm tight, I'm just gonna stretch, then we would essentially be pulling on this side and then pulling on this side, but we wouldn't be really making much change to this piece in the middle, so we'd kind of be wasting our time. So we need to do self myofascial release before we static stretch. We need to decrease that density, rub out the bumps, and then this thing will release, and then voila, we've got a nice, healthy piece of tissue that we can stretch. So, self myofascial release, poor man's massage, essentially, uh, essentially doing it if you can't afford a massage therapist. But if you can afford a massage therapist, that's very wise. Getting hands-on work is the best thing. One of the best things that you can do for yourself. So, um, you guys will see, we're trying to rub out the bumps and go hunting and camping, and that'll make sense later. Somebody tell me a couple tools that we use for SMR. We, we saw them earlier. What's kind of the main tool? <coughs> foam, roller. foam roller. That's a rumble roller, which is just a fancy foam roller. Um, all kinds of balls. All kinds of balls. This weekend, we're going to use the cross balls. Uh, I heard another one. The stick. <laughs> the stick. Uh, you can use water bottles. There's, there's a lot of a lot of tools, but it's essential at least that you have a lacrosse ball and a foam roller in your Zen room. For a hip static stretching, static stretching is uh, is essential. We all need to stretch, and a lot of us I'm sure have heard that hey, static stretching is bad. We it's going to decrease our power, and uh, that's not entirely true. We need to. Our order of warm-ups always goes rub out the bumps with self myofascial fast release, four-way hip static stretch, then do our gluteivation active warm-up, and then we do our workout, our explosive activity. Okay, we don't just go static stretch, explosive activity. There's got to be that 15 minutes of other stuff in the middle. So when we stretch the hips, we need to think, hey, I need to stretch front side, 
backside, inside, and outside. And I need to do the same both sides. As long as we think through front side, back side, inside, outside, we'll get to know our hips and we'll, uh, we'll, become, we'll become more symmetrical athletes. So <laughs> do I need to go into is do I need to go into static stretching and why have a lot of you guys heard that you shouldn't static stretch or are we past that? Past that? Okay. So Glutivation is uh, activation of the glutes. And this is so big, so big. Decrease in hamstring injuries. A lot of us, and you guys are sitting on, a, on your butts right now, right? Think, you guys have paninis in this country? You know what a panini machine is? Yeah. To make paninis, it's compression and heat. And that's essentially what you're doing to your butt right now. Compression and heat, you're taking those glute muscles and you're just laminating them together. They're not going to fire very well when you're sitting on your butt all the time. So a lot of us work desk jobs. Yeah, squeeze your butt every chance. Every time you stand up, squeeze your butt. It's essential. So if <laughs> or let somebody else do it. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Russia. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of bump stacks. So. <laughs> wake up, boy. Uh, so if we're sitting on our butt all the time and creating that grilled cheese panini butt, then when we go out to the field and we try to sprint, hip extension, this should go glute, then hamstring, then adductors. That's kind of the, the main muscle and extension should be the glutes. But if the glutes aren't working, then the hamstrings are going to do the work. And if the hamstrings are doing all the work for the glutes, you're going to get a hamstring injury. Or you're going to have that, you're one of those guys like, man, my hamstrings are always so tight, what's up? Dude, do some glutivation and turn on your butt and your hamstrings won't work. Or your hamstrings will, will feel better. It's almost that simple with hamstrings. Ten minutes? Okay. Also decrease the risk of knee injuries. So if I go, uh, most injuries happen on deceleration. So I'm landing or I'm going to cut and my knee collapses, and this femur slides over the tibia, and that ACL goes. Uh, you know, this motion, those of us that kind of squat, or this knee always collapses, it's because these outside glute muscles aren't working. These hip, these muscles that are responsible for external rotation of the hip. So if I can just teach these muscles to turn on, then when I go to plant, I'm gonna have more stability of the knee, I'm not gonna collapse, and therefore, I've got safer knees. So, decreasing the risk of knee injuries, turn on your glutes. Um, also, increases vertical and increases speed. So, we said, boom, that's hip extension. If I can get my glutes to be stronger and fire better, I'll get my hips through more powerfully, and I will jump higher, or I'll push the ground away better, I'll run faster. So, it's all about the glutes. All about the hashtag glutivation. <laughs> These are, uh, this is a kid I used to coach out at UNI. He got so into Olympic weightlifting that he went to China to cha train with the uh, Chinese Olympic weightlifters. And what I love about the way the Chinese Olympic weightlifters train is. Huh? Turtle blood. Turtle blood? Turtle blood. Turtle blood? Yeah. <coughs> So, <laughs> what, what do tur turtles are pretty slow. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's what we need to do, turtle blood for everybody. It's in your, it's, you're having it for lunch, you don't know they're putting it in your tea. That's how we're going to win this thing. Um, <laughs> okay. So, people ask me all the time, dude, how often can I train? I'm like, well, how much are you recovering? How much your body can handle in terms of performance training depends on how much time you're spending turning the ship around. So how much are you foam rolling, how much are you stretching, how, what's your nutrition like, how much water are you drinking, how much alcohol are you having, how much are you sleeping, uh, all these things go into recovering. So the Chinese Olympic weightlifters, most of them train three times a day. They're number one in the world in the sport of Olympic weightlifting, which is clean jerk snatch. So their life, they get up in the morning, they train. They immediately eat, they, they go hot tub, cold tub, they get a massage, they take a nap, 
They do some like dry needling and all kinds of crazy stuff, and then they lift again, and then they repeat, and then they lift again. That's their Somewhere whole life. Lift, recover, lift, recover, lift, recover, sleep, repeat the next day. And they can train three times a day, six days a week, because all they do is recover. So that's uh, <laughs> that's that's big. Um, <laughs> loading with weight room stuff, we gotta understand that like. Grinding like this is for bodybuilders. Bodybuilders need to do everything to uh, like max effort in order to get that hypertrophic or muscle building response. So bodybuilders push to the limit. Most of the time for us, we don't need to look like that when we're lifting weights. We'll burn out our, our central nervous system and we won't make progress. So people ask about loading and we'll talk about this later, but at five pounds a week, it should look it should look good. It should look in, in any kind of weight room stuff. If it doesn't look athletic, it's probably not athletic, and that's <laughs> today. And Arnold doesn't look super athletic. He's on the toilet. Okay. So last thing, I think we're almost done here. So goal setting and domination. Um, I really like the law of attraction, which just says that if you put energy into the universe, then that most likely will come back to you. So, so many of us make the mistake of not knowing exactly what we want. We don't write down our goals, we just float through life. If we say, if we take some time and kind of get in touch with ourselves, say, this is what I want, these are my goals, write them down, and then there's so much more uh, have a higher chance of coming back to you. It's, it's why prayer works. It's why it's why goal setting works. It's just that's how the universe works. So I really like the idea of writing a letter to your best self. So thinking, okay, who do I want to be at Europeans in 2015? What kind of person do I want to be? I want to be a badass athlete. I want to be a good person who operates with integrity. I want to be this, this, and this. If you write, hey, you know, Charlie, you kill it, you've got all these Ds, you're a great athlete, you're a great teammate, blah, 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 and you just say that, you don't have to share it with anybody, but just putting those thoughts out there really increases your chance of success. So I really encourage everybody to, to consider writing down your goals and writing a letter to your best self. Um, and in excellence, I mean, you guys, you know, I, I haven't felt you out yet, I haven't seen you train and seen how serious you are, but from, the, from what I get, you guys have some major goals, and you guys want to be not mediocre, you guys want to be the best. And that's, that's special, but not everybody has it in them. It's, it's a commitment to a lifestyle of, of excellence. And you have to commit to that, or you won't get it. So uh, there's really, there's no cutting corners. There's so many people just, hey, give me the program, I want to lift for three weeks, and then I want to go perform. No, it's every single day, it's a grind. That's what, that's what this is, and this is the beginning. So I really, I really love this quote, life is not about finding yourself, it's about creating yourself. You guys have an incredible opportunity here to do something that nobody else has ever done before, and I hope that you guys all uh, you know, realize that and, and make it happen. So that's all I got, it's time to go to work for, uh, for us. So. Um, okay, um, we start in eight minutes.